a happy uh, Tuesday to you. This is a rainy day, but uh, the spring is really looking beautiful. The grass is almost green now as a result of all of this rain. And uh, I want to speak to you today on the subject of Matthew, as in the Apostle. And uh, a number of years ago, I did a study on all of the Apostles, and I was quite amazed uh, uh, as I did that study because if I were to ask you today, how many times does the name Matthew or his other name, Levi, appear in the New Testament, uh, what would you say? Would you say it appears 15, 20, 30, 40, or whatever times uh, since he was one of the major apostles and wrote the Gospel of Matthew? You might be surprised. His name only appears either as Levi or Matthew eight times. Now that's quite amazing considering he wrote one of the great Gospels of the New Testament. Nevertheless, that's, that's the case. Around A.D. 27 uh, in Galilee and Capernaum, we find uh, Jesus doing a very interesting thing. We find the peculiar, the party, the Pharisees, and the purpose. The peculiar, the party, the Pharisees, and the purpose peculiar because Jesus has called fishermen, men who were already interested in uh, spiritual things because they had shown an interest with John the Baptist. And now suddenly it tells us in all of the three gospel accounts, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, that Jesus notices Levi or Matthew down by the seashore, and he's a tax collector. Now understand that uh, tax collectors were not thought very fondly uh, in those days because they were usually corrupt. Uh, they usually have been appointed by the Romans, uh, and their reputation, as Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 21 says, uh, in the same breath, uh, chapter 21, verse 32, let's see, yeah, verse 32, uh, he says, tax collectors and prostitutes. And that's how he put him. <laughs> I mean, even Jesus had categorized them as what the society saw as some of the lowest people. So he sees Matthew or Levi uh, down by the seashore in his tax booth, and uh, he says, come follow me. Now, here's a prestigious position, even though lowly thought of, just like politicians today, a uh, prestigious position, but not very highly thought of. Uh, and here he is, uh, able to make as much as he wants because he can tag on whatever surtaxes he wants to. And Jesus, uh, who's just got an itinerant ministry of wandering around the countryside, says, come follow me. I know my father said to me a number of years ago when I began my business career, son, never burn your bridges behind you. What he was saying is if you leave a job, don't have a lot of bad things to say and don't tell off your boss or anything like that because you never know when you may want to go back or you may never know when you want to use them as a reference. So here is uh, Matthew who has been hired by the Roman government and once he leaves to follow Jesus, who was seen as somewhat of a threat to the Roman government, uh, he's not going to ever get this position back. He's burning his bridges behind him. And so we see it's very peculiar, first of all, for Jesus to have called a tax gatherer. Uh, second of all, it's very unusual for somebody in that position and with that kind of income uh, to leave everything and burn his bridges behind him to follow Jesus. And then comes the party. You see, I believe strongly in relational evangelism. Let me say that again. I feel very strongly in relational evangelism. Uh, what happened was Matthew or Levi uh, sends out invitations to all of his tax collector friends and others that he's met in his business career. Uh, and you'll find it in Luke chapter 5, Mark chapter 2, and Matthew chapter 9. He has this great big party for tax collectors and others that he's associated with. Undoubtedly, uh, very few that were followers of Jesus, if any, and very few uh, that would have been esteemed uh, 
Hebrews, party, evangelism, uh, relational evangelism. Ladies can have evangelistic teas or coffees at their house and invite their lost friends. Men can invite others to game suppers and so on. One thing you want to remember when you do relational evangelism is draw the net. Don't just have an activity uh, and then hope that it was a good positive influence on the community. Have an event and be sure that there is a drawing of the net. There's an invitation for people to receive Christ. I don't mean beat them over the head with the Bible, but I mean have somebody share their personal testimony, have somebody ask some questions. Uh, don't uh, abuse them and don't browbeat them, but be sure you do draw the net. So we have the peculiar, we have the party, and then we have the Pharisees. And remember, they were the religious leaders of the day, uh, just as we have <laughs> religious leaders in our churches today. And they were grumbling. <laughs> they missed the whole point. Uh, and they're calling uh, to each other and saying, uh, what kind of man is this that eats with sinners and such as that? Well, let me just say to you something about separation. We're to be separated from this world uh, so that it doesn't influence us in a negative way. But if we become so separated from this world that we don't ever have an association with anybody that's not saved, nobody will ever get saved. So the Pharisees grumbling at Jesus because he was associating with those that needed to come to a, a personal relationship with him and with God, uh, he's, he's recognizing that he has enough strength to not be dragged down to their level at the same time, he's going to be a positive influence on their lives. And this uh, particular relational evangelism that he's doing. So remember that separation has its positives and its negatives. We don't want to be of the world, uh, but we need to be in the world. We need to be talking to people about Jesus. So we have the party and we have the Pharisees grumbling. Uh, and I guess we always have a few Pharisees in the church that don't want us to have somebody different come into our congregation uh, or visit with us or sit in the pews with us, but that's part of evangelism. Finally, the purpose. Again, in Luke chapter 5, Mark chapter 2, and Matthew chapter 9, we find uh, the, the sinners uh, uh, having come to sit down with Jesus, and I'm sure there were lots of conversions uh, at that party and following that party. But Jesus makes a profound statement, and he says, I desire compassion, not sacrifice. Learn what that means. He says, learn what it means to have compassion and not sacrifice. You see, we need to see those around us that are lost just that way. We need to see them as lost, destined for an eternity in hell. That means we need to have compassion on them so that we would come in contact with them through relational evangelism and see them come to know Christ. That's what God placed us here for as his church. You'll find the same thought in Hosea chapter 6 verse 6 in the Old Testament. You see, it's all about telling people the good news of Jesus Christ. That's your thought for the day. I hope that you'll do a relational evangelistic activity in your home, in your workplace, uh, someplace where you can impact the lost world around us. God bless you and have a great day.